interesting how it's taken a lot of words, a lot of self-dialogue in order to replace the programming I've been given about mental illness. Even though I never really believed the diagnosis when I got it. I remember thinking, that's not it. Even though I knew that wasn't it, I didn't really know what it was. And I still don't. But I'm starting to feel like we're not mentally ill, we're neuroplastic. We're not our egos, we're not our personalities. I feel like I'm not mentally ill. My brain is trying to grow into higher levels of consciousness, but it's not really mirrored and reflected in society. So it's difficult to stay there if one doesn't really understand what's going on. And especially if one doesn't understand what's going on and goes back down to lower levels of consciousness, back to ego consciousness, and then if one inherits the understanding that it's just a pathological mental illness, then one's definitely not going to grow into higher levels of consciousness. One's definitely not going to act in ways that will actually help grow the brain in these other ways. And I think that's one of the reasons why in mania we connect with things like altruism and and so many of these things related to the oneness of humanity because it's this higher level of consciousness and then we come back down and we're told we have this individual mental illness when our brains were growing into the consciousness of oneness which isn't the dominant level of consciousness but one can still move towards that one can still work to neuroplastically rewire one's brain according to that by harvest practicing embodying one's mania. And I don't even think one actually has to really harvest practice and embody it. One just has to open one's brain back up to learning moment to moment. Whether it's learning about prior manic states or whether it's just going out and embodying it. Embodying something other than one's habitual conditioned personality by allowing the surprise of consciousness to interject the stream of habitual self, ego, me, reflexive thoughts. The brain is trying to actualize its potential to embody the mind, to embody the consciousness that is the highest level of consciousness we're here to embody, which is unconditional love. It's almost like our brains have gotten to a point where they're just getting so narrow that it collapses upon itself and then phew, the neuroplastic process turns back on as an emergency mechanism of consciousness to save, to salvage some brains. We can only save our own brain. It's transconscious brain growth when the brain gets access to higher levels of consciousness, it grows. It grows neurons to actually be able to mirror that level of consciousness. So people who have gone to those higher states have the blueprint. It's just a matter of acting based on that blueprint. It grows because it can see different perspectives. So seeing is what grows the brain. Actually seeing. We're always seeing the past, so the brain's not growing. And consciousness is non-local, it can leave the body. I had an experience once where I was a bird flying south. And in that process we learn different meanings. We learn other meanings of what it is to be alive. And then when we come back to ego consciousness, we re-inherit those meanings. And not only that, we inherit the meaning that we're defective and we're mentally ill. And this isn't about convincing anyone that they're not mentally ill or that they are mentally ill. It's about finding out for yourself what you want to think about yourself. And being confused is an important part of the process because it means we have to rearrange our mental models 
just like Jason Silva says, with the experience of awe, an experience of such perceptual vastness that we literally have to rearrange our mental models in order to integrate it. The prefrontal cortex is what generates abstract thoughts. And when we decouple from our ego, and then we come back to it, we can have some scary thoughts that we don't think we are thinking. But it's generated by the prefrontal cortex. And when we're trying to end our life, we're actually trying to end the prefrontal cortex. We're trying to end those thoughts and our personality. We're not actually trying to end our life. Some of us do end up ending our life, but we really just want those thoughts to stop. Again, it's another mechanism by which the prefrontal cortex is being destroyed it's by people ending their own lives. Being told we're defective is very destructive because we're just getting back to learning. And if we're told we're defective, we're not going to continue learning. We're going to stop the learning process. Not only that, we tend to isolate because we think we're defective. And then that isolation also causes further atrophying of the brain. It atrophies the relational aspect of the brain and the mind. So part of harvesting mania is thinking about things in many, many ways and not grasping onto anything in particular. Through my whole process of self-dialogue, I haven't held too tightly onto anything that I've said. And in not hanging onto anything tightly, I've had more insights into how I might want to talk about it with myself to the point now where I'm seeing that it could just be the brain attempting to grow and it's growing pains and the brain is trying to grow into consciousness and I like that reframe I'm curious to know what's to come in terms of reframing, but I feel I've definitely gotten to the point of talking myself out of feeling like it's a mental illness. And like I said, I've never really felt that it was, but I've, I've still participated in things related to mental illness. And a lot of it is very valuable, especially the psychosocial stuff because it keeps people from isolating and and a lot of the people I know who I'm friends with through this process are amazing people and so for me it has nothing to do with mental illness it's just about connecting with friends in map consciousness we suspend our opinions and our judgments or they're suspended for us and they're pushed out by the speed of processing in which we can see clearly in the moment and understand and then that produces a lot more words because of that information coming through all the senses clear seeing and clear perception is what grows the brain it makes sense because if we're thinking something old it's not going to be something new that's going to grow the brain expand the brain make new connections it's an old connection and if the brain is clear, it can see and it can learn. And I feel like you might find if you can see and learn in that way, there's not really that much else you need. You don't need motivation. You don't need all of these other abstract concepts because your brain is clear and it's doing exactly what it is meant to do. And so that's all the meaning it needs. It doesn't have to search for meaning because the very meaning is the brain, which is learning. And if it can't learn, it's going to be looking for meaning because it's all clogged up with abstractions and, and, and crap. I was thinking about a lot of these nutritional biotypes of bipolar, how they require more B vitamins and and B vitamins are mostly made in our gut by gut bacteria so this could have something to do with 
again, how the microorganisms and how we kill them is actually destroying our brains. And I think that is the case in some research in autism and, and it is partly the case with mental health. And they even say 80% of serotonin is made in the gut. So with our overuse of antibiotics, we think we're killing these pathogens, but really we're destroying our own brains. And the bacteria actually help to create our brains. The bacteria partly are our brains and we're against them too. And bipolar is like bipolar hypersensitivity and bipolar hyperperception. And when we're hypersensitive and hyperperceiving, we're hyperlearning because we see more, so we, we're processing more. We feel more, we're processing more. Society is designed in such a way that we don't even feel how we're killing ourselves in a slow and painful way. Our emotions too are because we're not learning. We're busy thinking about the past and emoting about the past and that's wasting our molecules and our nutrition and then we need more nutrition in order to actually exist in the material world and and we're emoting about the past because we're not fully engaged in the present so all of this waste of energy is because we're not in the present moment because we can't deal with what's happening in the present moment because we don't know how because we don't know how to learn because we're busy thinking about the past and we've turn the material world into habit and by doing that we're habitually going about our day and we're not even present and then we're busy worrying and emoting about things in our brain so we're living in our own emotions in our brain if we're fully engaged in the present learning we wouldn't be emoting and we wouldn't be wasting our nutrients and and destroying our brains map consciousness showed me what I need to do to build the dream center and I think I talked about the dream center before and I just want to tell myself about it again when I think about it the dream center would be about allowing people to go through their transconscious experience in order to shift from perceiving through the past the scar tissue of neurons in the brain and that is decoupled from and then all of a sudden one is existing as their neuroplastic brain their infinitely pliable brain as Krishnamurti would say they're not acting as a programmed reaction to the past finished watching Sean Blackwell's videos and he talked about how the spectrum of psychosis is the same as the spectrum of consciousness so in a way the remedy for psychosis is an increase in level of consciousness and I don't think the question is how to solve mental illness it's how to be fully alive and gesture oneself into joy. Will you join me?